students, I am coming to you live from the e-learning center at IIT Roorkee. When we are at this stage of our presentations, I would like to once again acknowledge the help of my team, Shreya and Farhan who are working with me and the support of the e-learning center at IIT Roorkee bringing this uh, material to you. Shall we move forward with the impact of Western architects and we are looking at Louis Kahn, this is part 4, the influence of Louis Kahn load bearing brick walls, arches and circular openings that he brought in IIM Ahmedabad. These are just the outward elements of the building. His contribution or his influence goes deeper than that into the spaces that he created. The kind of technology that was available to him, he made use of the same technology to create this amazing architecture that goes on to show that even when an architect is constrained by the kind of technology and materials, resources, even economic uh, constraints that are there upon him in a project, he can still produce amazing architecture. Because in those constraints, he has to work to create those amazing spaces. The works of Corbusier and, I am, uh, and, and, and Louis Kahan are a reflection of that. So, here we have examples of buildings like the modern school in New Delhi by Sajdev Engelston Associates 1974-78, there is a Chinmaya Mission Centre in Ahmedabad by Mahinder Kothari 75-79 and then we look at the EDII building in Ahmedabad from 1985-87 to by Bimal Patel. All these projects in exposed brick and exposed concrete, the kind of elements used here are and a reflection of his influence, influence of Louis Kahan. Modern school, for example, the spaces, the, the kind of form that has been created with the exposed brick is so close to that of I am Ahmedabad. So, these are the, uh, the corridors one above the other, the archwork and the circular cutout that you see here and then you find it here in I am Ahmedabad. This kind of um, a corridor uh, uh, in I am Ahmedabad and then you look at spaces here in modern school. So, you find the same kind of identity being reflected here or this one, this is extremely interesting because this kind of uh, uh, element was created in the National Assembly of Bangladesh and you find it repeated here in the modern school. Then we have a project that looks nothing like I am Ahmedabad. It is not an exposed brick, it is a brutalist work. So, is it closer to the work of Corbusier? Let us have a look. The Dutsagar Sagar Dairy Complex, which is uh, uh, under the aegis of the National Dairy Development Board, NDDB. And this is a milk processing plant for the National Dairy Board. You might have heard of the name of Korean, who was uh, the person behind what was called as the White Revolution in India when milk production in India really shot up. It was something very, very closely parallel to the green revolution. There was a time in India when we had to import food from outside because we did not produce the amount of food that was needed by our population and we went through some very dire times. It was very, uh, it was a very difficult period and it was then that the Indian government of the time began the process of green and white revolution. Today, we have surplus. We are one of the highest uh, food producing, grain producing countries in the world and one of the high largest production of milk happens in India. And this is, this building is a kind of that moment, it, it gives you that historical uh, uh, takes you back into history to show what amazing things were done at that time. It is a very stark and brutalistic geometrical composition on a monumental scale. So, when we talk of stark, when we talk of monumental, we are reminded of Kahan. It is a geometric composition, we are reminded of Kahan. It is brutalist, we are reminded of Corbusier. Geometric is also a remembrance of Corbusier when we look at the works of the capital complex in Chandigarh. There is a graphic banding in the ex of exterior finish which articulates a very, it is a very muscular building, it is a very robust building. And the, it is all, there is also the application of the concept of servant and served spaces of Louis Kahan. 
milk delivery and milk processing adjoin an already existing an old dairy plant which was built earlier by another architect and the walls and structures that have been used here are more aesthetic than technical in the function of containing and supporting the process which is taking place within. This is this project is interesting in that what an architect can do in a very technical brief that has been given to him, milk processing and he generates a building that is iconic, that is a reflection of the kind of work being done by Indian architects. There is also one more thing, this building also shows the change in the direction of architecture of A.P. Kanwinde. As you know, we looked at his works that were a, kind, a direct reflection of Bauhaus when we look at the Atira office building that he had done, when you look at the projects done under the CSIR, the various labs that he made, all of them are connected to Bauhaus. But then we move on 10 years ahead from the 1950s into the 1960s and 70s here, this is the beginning of the 70s and we find Kanwinde changing. We find his buildings become more artistic so to speak, more sculptural, there is a geometric expression in them, there is a, there is a um, very interesting massing about them. So, you find it here, you find it in the NDDB board office building, we look at a photograph of that later in this presentation, you find it there in a, a, a science centre that he designed in Delhi. So, you find that change coming just as it happened in the case of say for example, Courbusier. He began with the pure international style geometry uh, which is cuboidal, white, planar, unornamented geometry and fine finished blocks which was connected to the overall international style functionalism Bauhaus. And then Courbusier shifted completely to a more sculptural more robust, monumental, muscular expression in brutalism. You find that in United Habitation and the buildings he did in India. And the same in a sense parallelly I feel is happening in the life of a weekend wind day. This is, this is a shift and it is a major shift. Now, coming back to this building, the process of making milk powder and storing and the shipping of the product determined the layout and hierarchy of the complex's structures, but architecture does not express the actual mechanics of production. Going back to this point again, the walls and structures are more aesthetic than technical. That means, the architect has embodied the technical aspect into a very aesthetic sculptural or geometric form. Kahan's distinction between servant and served spaces that we find in the Richards Memorial Lab in the University of Pennsylvania is also reflected in the Dutsagar project. Do make an attempt by taking the plan of the Dutsagar project and identifying the served and the servant spaces. RCC frame, frames with brick infill panels and tall van, ventilation shafts are required to dissipate the moisture that is used in making the powdered milk and we will come to this point again. The main processing plant you find these high rise elements, these shafts rising up and contributing to this massing and this high rise element houses the desiccating process and that is produced turning milk into milk powder. So, here we have it. The milk condensing and spray drying equipment requires a multi storage space which is this. It also generates excess heat that needs to be dissipated. Therefore, the equipment is framed within a 7 square meter RCC grid which is pro that provides access to several floors. Metal grills permit this air to pass from floor to floor around the periphery and the exterior there are these ventilation points that are expressed as these vertical shafts that you see here. Let us go back again, these are the shafts that you see here and they rise above the roof level, stand out and the shafts evacuate the hot air by natural convection thus eliminating the need of a mechanical exhaust system. Something that we find in the buildings of the period, more approach of towards passive architecture, less dependence on things like 
mechanical air conditioning systems etc in this case a mechanical exhaust system primarily because of maybe constraint of budget or maybe tho those those facilities were not so readily uh, available or uh, uh, you know the the the, the, the it, we are our budgets uh, did not allow the, that, that kind of equipment to be used uh, so readily in these buildings architects were constrained by this and therefore they have forced to look at passive solutions and i believe that resulted in these very interesting buildings which are which were sustainable empirically it was not the word sustainability in green did not exist at the time then when we we moved on economy became much stronger post liberalization buildings uh, uh, we became a global economy connected uh, with with other nations of the world that kind of progress led to those buildings uh, for example in glass and steel or glass and rcc work where you could have complete active control in the building it was affordable many multinationals established themselves in india they brought in that kind of mola that was needed to produce such kind of heavily energy dependent buildings but the consequence of that is we are today in an era where there is a tremendous amount of carbon emissions from buildings i might roll you the figure early as 39% india stands third in the total carbon emissions globally after us and china it's a huge number it if if the data is correct from i believe the 1990s to today we have jumped more than 300% in carbon emissions and that is you know very clearly linked to liberalization policy when it happened the the immense jump in carbon emissions can be directly tagged to when we liberalized ourselves when we really started building a huge amount of buildings lot of cities really developed very very fast because of the growing economy and high gdp but the consequence of that is what has happened in uh, the 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 carbon emissions now that is not an indian problem it's an international problem and therefore today we are compelled to design our buildings sustainably make them green reduce carbon emissions something that was a natural reaction of these architects at the time the difference in height between spray drying and condensing facilities has been aesthetically exploited by kanwinde by providing this huge this these shafts that just go up and there is a variation in the heights and that creates it this interesting form of the building this is the milk delivery dock that you find uh, here so the massing in kanwinde's project what you find in the dudh sagar dairy project in 71 to 74 you find this in um, interesting massing in the nddb office building in delhi in 1983 both are brutalist buildings and both are examples of massing in fact the massing of nddb office building in delhi was a very unique office building massing at that time and really stood out from other office buildings Let's come to the Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India ID, EDII by Bimal Patel in 1987. This was established to augment the country's supply of entrepreneurs through education and training. 1985, a national competition was held to select the architect to design EDII, which was won by Bimal Patel. And this project also won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 1992. It is a complex of brick structures organized around a main courtyard with several outdoor spaces. It is exposed brick and concrete, as you find in Louis Kahn's work. And then there are these other elements of Louis Kahn that you find the arches, etc., and the stark brick uh, uh, brick facade that is there, silent, unornamented, the same kind of identities I remember, but though not so monumental. These are some of the pictures of the project. the architect claims that his design was shaped by three factors number 1 his master's thesis when he was studying in california he studied the formal patterns in indian islamic architecture something that i pointed out earlier with regard to louis kahn that he was uh, impressed by islamic patterns 
and we find that geometric shapes uh, uh, which uh, uh, are connected to those Islamic patterns. Also, he read the work of a new urbanist and new classical architecture theorists and again this is in connection to Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn was classically minded uh, throughout his architectural life. There was a, there was a a uh, part of his architecture where this classical identity was reflected. Bimal Patel was also aware that he was heading a design firm which was a very well established and a um, very respected design firm in modern architecture and the works that were done by his father Hasmuk C. Patel. The client's assistance, assistance in this project was to make the campus in harmony with the surrounding landscape and not to be dependent on artificial energy. Ahmedabad was founded in 1411 by the Muslims and it is an endowed city having splendid mix of mosques, mausoleums, courtyard houses etc. And Patel picked up on that, his design is to establish a connection with this rich accumulation of India's past. So for example, when you see this building, when you see this, uh, arc, this, this corridor and you compare it with the brick corridor of Bimal Patel. When you see this kind of uh, courtyard space with this uh, colonnade, uh, co co corridor on the side and you compare it with the work of Bimal Patel, it is not a one to one reflection. It is not like he just borrowed the form of the column in and put it here. He interpreted that in a modern form. But you see that when you look at it closely, you see the same kind of spaces appearing here. Now, the architect's organizational principles and his use of a limited palette of building materials, in this case exposed brick, stone and wood with very minimal application of RCC and steel trusses. RCC of course is used uh, in uh, the slab work and beams etc. and uh, the use of corrugated aluminum sheet. Now there is a use of that, you find that for example in the trust that is created here. It is also a direct reflection like I said of Islamic sources and this is a starkness in the unornamented brick facade and the arches that he has used which is a reminder of Louis Kahn's I am Ahmedabad. The difference being that is a more monumental project. The silence that you feel in this project, the, the, the kind of a sense of loneliness that is generated here. He generates that in I am Ahmedabad, he generates that in Salk Institute, Bimal Patel tries to create that same feeling of serenity, simplicity in this project. The formal orthogonal geometry dominates the layout of the project. These are the courts that have been created and there are a series of courts, large and small. The buildings are juxtaposed in the landscape to create these series of outdoor spaces. So this is the uh, uh, plan layout of the project. The sequences of spaces are linked by courts and corridors, something that was there in traditional Indian architecture. In fact, we are already seeing an example of regional modernism or critical regionalism when we look at EDII. It is already there in, in, a, in a sense in Sept Ahmedabad because it is a climate responsive project, one of the principles behind regional modernism. Now the word why I am using regional modernism, the word that you will find, that the term that you will find more often is critical regionalism. But somehow regional modernism gels more with me, it is more simple to understand. It is a modernism that is having a regional context. So there are five Vananda type buildings here, three are academic these three are academic and these two are dormitories. And then there are series, this is a court created between them, this is another court because there is another building that is going to come up, we will show it in the next slide. And then there are a series of courts in between them, series of open spaces created in between them. This is the building that was supposed to come later. It is a future auditorium. The campus consists of residential facilities, classrooms, offices, libraries organized within these seven buildings linked by the, there are two axes. This is the one, this is the other. Please understand that this I believe is a conscious attempt by the architect to generate these kind of spaces. Also there is a, a, a diagonal, I, diagonal spaces that he creates. What are you reminded of when you look at diagonal spaces? For example, here in the library or here or here in the future auditorium, I am reminded again of I am Ahmedabad. These are the 
sectional elevations of the building. The area of the courts is large in proportion to building heights. Now, when I say this, please look at an earlier point I made with regard to the building height and the courtyard space when I was talking about the management development uh, center in I am Ahmedabad by Anant Raje. And I told you that he lowered the scale of the courtyard and because of the comparatively human scale of the buildings as compared to the monumental scale of the IIM buildings. In the IIM building, the LIK plaza also has a monumentality. But in this case, it is not happening in the same way. The courtyard appears to be larger in comparison to the height of the building. Now, one thing that can be done when this happens and I believe that is also happening here in Vimal Patel's work is by providing different elements within it to kind of give a sense of lowering of that scale. Now, I will give you an example, you can look it up. In the 1970s and 80s, when Lick Tech architecture came up in the west, that is very sleek glass buildings came up. One idea that came up during that time was that of an atrium space enclosed in the building. There was a firm, John Portman and Associates, they did certain projects for the high regency chain of hotels. And these buildings had these massive atriums going all the way in a, in a uh, many, many stories. But what they did was that at the level, the, the ground level of the atrium, they created small, small pockets of different spaces, sitting spaces, um, interacting spaces, etc. So, at that level, if you enter in, you do feel the monumentality, the massiveness of the atrium space, but at the same time, because of the small spaces created all over the atrium, you the, it, it brings down the scale perceptively to you. You do not get overawed by the atrium because of this. Now, here the campus grounds are planted with these evergreen trees, again something that has happened post the works of Kurbuzir and Khan. I mean, it is already there in traditional Indian architecture. They just brought that and most of these architects relied heavily on the green areas to, uh, uh, to build uh, the, the uh, passive uh, uh, climate feature in the building. Khan's impact is seen in the arches, the exposed brick and concrete and the slit light that is coming from the top. But the parapets here, I told you that this is, an, uh, this is a part of the regional modernist context. When you look at the parapet here, this is traditionally Indian. So, here Bimal Patel adds this identity. So, regional modernism or critical regionalism. The scale is not monumental like Khan I told you earlier, but there is a consistent vocabulary whether it is on the outside or whether it is in the interiors. There is a play of light and shade, something in which Louis Khan was a master. The verandas, the recessed windows, and the thick walls reduce the heat loads in the interiors and passively, the building is passively cooled through the design. Again, you find these spaces and you find how much of the uh, glare has this tried to cut down. Corridors, verandas and light sources, this shows you the light coming in from the top. And this kind of brick and concrete construction in the 1960s in Ahmedabad, especially in the works of Kurbuzir and then Kahan and Doshi and then onwards in many other architects. Also, there is a limited number of materials chosen because of restricted budget. So, there is economy and simplicity, there is limited workmanship and construction skills available. So, that also impacts the project. Again, I will repeat constraints actually enhance the quality of these projects rather than pulling them down because the architect with those constraints labors to bring make it as efficient and beautiful as possible. So, he, he has to focus more on, on creating that kind of aesthetic quality through his design. The way the materials have been combined establishes a theme that unites the various buildings into one whole. So, the Aga Khan committee commended Patel for his confident use of formal elements out of Indo-Islamic architectural heritage, there are these geometrically structured courtyards and loggias. There is a variation of open, closed and transitional spaces provided 
providing light and shade and this is an in inviting environment for work interaction and just plain repose. Now, the impact of Louis Kahn did not just end in the 80s. Here is a project in 2021, a home in Delhi by AKD firm and this again reminds you of Louis Kahn in this circular cutout in the elevation of the building. It is a square exposed brick screen with this massive circular opening inspired from Kahn's work. His influence continues. Of course, this is a very uh, very direct Im, uh, influ, uh, you know, imp imitation of Kahn's work. I believe the principles continue of all these master architects of the time. To conclude, with Kutbuzir and Louis Kahan, Indian architects got to observe firsthand the design process of the leading architects of the day. Now, I am making these points because we are wrapping up with these the impact of Western architects. We have looked at Kurbuzier, Khan, and Walter Gropius. Now, this experience gave these Indian architects the tools to design their buildings with boldness and skill. There are other projects that we we'll look in the days ahead where I will tell you more about this uh, statement that I have made here. With the experience, the second generation of Indian architects, earlier we were talked about the first generation that had studied in the West and come to India. Now, there is a second generation that followed them. They moved away from the direct influence of the masters. Please remember, when we look at the first generation works, for example, Habib Rahman, Nepi Kanvedni, we see a direct influence. But as they move forward, the first generation also moves away from a very direct you know, you, you do not find a direct imitation, you find a kind of an indirect impact. The thinking on their own of developing climatically and culturally appropriate design to solve Indian problems, something that modernist architecture in itself was could not do. It was just a faceless uh, form uh, all over the world that does not take away the fact that it brought about a radical change in building design or in architecture all over the world. That contribution can never be understated, but there were typical Indian problems that had to be addressed. The issues like climate, heat, dust, winter chills, social context, all these became increasingly important design buildings by these architects and often more important that simple pragmatic job of erecting a building quickly within a tight budget. Kurbuzier gave them a new vision what architects and architecture could be. You can say in a sense, Kurbuzier and Gropius and Mies van der Rohe and all these architects would have attracted a lot of young people towards architecture. They were star architects of the time. Today, the word architects has been coined to define architects like Frank Gehry, Zaha Hadith, etc. But I believe they were also, rather than just saying star architects, we could call them masters. In William Curtis and Bhatt's book, they, uh, sorry, Peter Scriver and Bhatt's book, this, the, the book is titled After the Masters. Kahan taught us how to handle materials in light. Charles Ames and his wife taught us pedagogical philosophy. Without Kavuzier, would the wave of brutalist concrete have been seen in the world? Without Kahan, would we learn about forms and brickwork of his compositions? As an enhanced curiosity in young Indian architects to find solutions dealing with the world to be inhabited, and they had a broader architectural vision as a result of these works in India. We will stop here, and with this, we end a look, a very brief and very limited look at what the Western architects gave us. They left us with a very rich legacy. All the way from the British times and post independence, the British architects who continue to work in India down to people all the way to people like Louis Kahn etc. They contributed immensely to the architectural education of young Indian architects. Not just in a classroom, but actually by the buildings that they designed, they became the sources of our architectural education. Thank you so much. We will come back again to you and we will start with an introduction to critical regionalism. We will also have a presentation of what might be called as an interlude. We will just stop 
in a presentation and go back to look at these ideas again through some new projects and see how the, the trend continues to develop. Thank you so much.